Hello and welcome to another video trying to get you the very top grades on Macbeth. Using just one quotation in the video, fair is foul and foul is fair. And linking it to the four main themes of the play which suck up all the other themes, they're all contained within here. And I've also gone through the exam papers and worked out all the kinds of questions that you can be asked and this quotation. I'm going to try and make fit every single question. Let's see how quickly we can do it. We'll begin with an analysis of the patriarchy, a society controlled by men in their interests. So our first interpretation is why the weird sisters believe that fair is foul and foul is fair. Well, one interpretation is that the fairer sex, women, are in fact more foul. And this is an idea that goes back to original sin, where Eve tempted Adam with the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And therefore, they were expelled from Eden for eating that forbidden fruit. So Shakespeare is just using society's perspective of women as um, looking more attractive on the outside, but being much less attractive on the inside, foul inside and fair outside. But something else is also going on because the weird sisters look foul on the outside. Foul is fair. And this suggests that actually what they're offering is attractive. And it's true. They're offering Macbeth a taste of the future which says he will become Thane of Cawdor and then will become king. And what's interesting here is the quotation tells us straight away that Macbeth does not have to kill Duncan. He can get there by fair means, but he uses his free will to choose foul means. So, so far we have seen that women are the temptresses in this society. They appear uh, to be fair on the outside, but actually they're more evil than men. And one reading of the play is Shakespeare is just perpetuating that social view. The other social view is about the nature of original sin and he's suggesting that women are more responsible for the sins of mankind because of that original sin of Eve. And we've already talked about the idea of fate and destiny and this quotation showing that Macbeth could just choose to wait and accept his fate of becoming king. But instead he exercises his free will in a foul way, chooses to hurry that destiny up and therefore turns to evil. If we look at it in terms of the great chain of being, where God, a male figure, sits at the top of the social hierarchy, then the angels, uh, then the Pope, and then his chosen kings and queens, we see that Macbeth chooses a foul way to attain what he thinks is fair, the kingship, but he does so in a way which attacks God because God has appointed Duncan and regicide directly goes against God's instruction. This means that Macbeth takes something which seems desirable, fair and beautiful, uh, but turns it into something undesirable and foul. So he re reduces his own kingship to something he cannot ever enjoy because of the crime he committed to get it. And so Shakespeare does this as a warning to anyone else in his audience not to go against the king. And remember, his audience for the play is all the nobles at court. The play isn't put on first at the Globe. It's put on at the court of King James and it's supported by King James. Well, there we have another contextual reason for the appearance of the witches here. So Shakespeare introduces the foul topic of witchcraft that would have frightened Jacobean audiences because most of them would believe in the evil power of witches and witchcraft. But to King James, this will be something seductive and fair because he's passionately interested in it and has written his book Demonology, outlining all kinds of factors about witches. And so there is a kind of unwritten uh, or unspoken joke here on Shakespeare's part where he's providing something that's disgusting to most people but he knows that King James will find it really attractive and a major point of interest in the play. 
And that, of course, brings us back to the theme of the patriarchy. Um, it's very likely that in a male society, one that's dominated by men, uh, they would have a vested interest in picking the most evil characters to be female. And that's why witches are overwhelmingly female in this play. So we've talked about how Macbeth makes the wrong moral choice. Now let's look at Lady Macbeth. She epitomizes this idea of the patriarchal representation of Eve. She appears attractive on the outside, but underneath she is the most evil in this reading of the play because she persuades Macbeth, just like Eve persuades Adam, to kill Duncan. Uh, so this condemns Lady Macbeth as worse than her husband. This is why she gets killed first, we could argue, and why her guilt leads her to take her own life. We could also flip that, however, and say that Shakespeare is arguing women are better than men. So Lady Macbeth appreciates her own guilt, realises that she's gone against God and believes that her soul is damned, whereas Macbeth fights on, uh, feeling no guilt whatsoever. He never uh, really focuses on his guilt at killing Duncan. Uh, he just soldiers on murdering ever-increasing numbers of people. So in this way, Shakespeare might be claiming the patriarchy is a terrible system because men are worse than women, and he uses the marriage of Macbeth and Lady Macbeth to prove it. Now, he also does that with Macduff. I think that Shakespeare can really blame Macduff for what happens to his family. Macduff abandons his family. All right, Macbeth didn't have to kill his family, but it was highly likely as soon as Macduff made clear he'd gone off to join Malcolm and the English. So he, in effect, invites Macbeth to kill them. And that's a point that Lady Macduff points out to her son before they're murdered. She certainly blames Macduff for what happens to them. That's an idea of Macduff the hero, being fair, also being foul. He is the one who sacrifices his own family in order to give him enough motive to come back and kill Macbeth. Now, when we talk about the supernatural, uh, we have an interesting perspective. What's interesting about the witches is they only describe what is. There is no will here. In other words, they're not saying we can change the future. We can do something to make uh, the future happen in a different way. They simply say what appears fair is actually foul and what appears foul is actually fair. And in the same way, their prophecies are neither good nor evil. They're just stating the fact. Macbeth will be king. Banquo's son will be king. They're not actually committing any evil act. And if we take the naming of the witches, they're never called the witches. They are called the Weird Sisters. It's only this Christian patriarchal society which labels them as witches, which labels them as evil. But actually, they never commit an evil act. And so you can certainly argue that Shakespeare is on their side. This is why they simply become weird sisters and not witches. So if you take that view, you are arguing that he is against the patriarchal society. However, he puts enough in the play for it to satisfy a Christian reading to suggest that the witches are evil, that they do control Macbeth and Lady Macbeth, and therefore they are witches. We've already touched upon the, the idea of guilt in Lady Macbeth's reaction, uh, contrasted to Macbeth's lack of guilt. Uh, everything about uh, what we've discussed looks at the nature of right and wrong. Uh, so we've covered morality. Now we need to consider power. Well, we've already considered that when we've talked about the great chain of being, male power in the patriarchy, and the power of Christianity to control how we think about these women. So if we go back to that point of Shakespeare's deliberately not naming them as witches, uh, we can see the power of Christianity to change our perspective so that what might be fair is perceived as foul. The witches are fair not as in beautiful, but as in just, because they simply tell the truth, and yet the truth is then spun as something foul and satanic, 
and they are condemned uh, for revealing this truth. We've already spoken about kingship and how Macbeth ruins the jewel of kingship, if you like, uh, by his decision to choose foul means to get the fair prize of kingship. We've discussed Banquo in detail. Uh, we've looked how, at how Duncan was appointed by God by divine right through the great chain of being. Well, how is Duncan also foul? Well, if you think about it, Duncan is deceived by the original Thane of Cawdor. He says there is no art to find the mind's construction in the face, and he claims that he couldn't possibly have spotted that the Thane of Cawdor was a traitor. Uh, but the second time that happens, we stop believing him. The second time that happens, of course, is when he makes Macbeth the Thane of Cawdor. And this is like fate yelling out to Duncan, saying, look, Macbeth is also a traitor. He is also the Thane of Cawdor. The Thane of Cawdor is a traitor. And Duncan is blind to this. So although he seems fair, his judgment is foul, and he is therefore murdered. Um, now, you might decide that this is part of God's plan. He gets rid of Duncan because he is not a deserving king. Unfortunately, Macbeth is the person who does that by committing evil acts, and so he too must be punished before natural order is apparently restored with Malcolm coming to the throne. And then finally, we have Macduff, and I've already covered him in quite a bit of detail, showing you how he is also foul, though appearing fair. So this idea of appearance being the opposite to reality, we all know is a theme that runs throughout the play. But if I get a question on appearance and reality, I'm now going to write about how society portrays women as both foul and fair, and how society's uh, Christian viewpoint portrays women as both foul and fair, and how God, in his uh, instructions through the great chain of being, looks at kingship and Duncan and Macduff as being both foul and fair, and then the idea of foulness and fairness being uh, destinies that people can allow to happen or choose to make more foul. Just as Macbeth could have allowed himself to become king, but instead chose his destiny by committing regicide. The final choice is Banquo's. Um, he had the choice to expose Macbeth. He could have revealed to everyone their meeting with the Weird Sisters, and that would certainly have cast great suspicion on Macbeth, um, seizing power and control by becoming king, uh, it would have implicated him strongly as the murderer of Duncan, but he doesn't do that because he needs Macbeth to stay on the throne longer so that Fleance can become king later. Banquo knows he must let fate take its course and interfering with fate will make matters worse, but that is also a foul choice because it is immoral. Um, it, if you like, sacrifices the country of Scotland to Macbeth's tyranny uh, simply so Fleance can later become king. Whereas if he'd made a moral choice at the moment that Duncan was killed, uh, he and Macduff could easily have decided that Macbeth was probably the murderer, arrested him, perhaps put him on trial and executed him. All right, that might mean that the witch's prophecy about Fleance wouldn't come true. But um, that would have been a worthy sacrifice, I'd suggest, sacrificing the chance of your son becoming king in order to save your country from a murderous rule from the tyrant Macbeth. So there you have it, one quotation which fits every theme in the play and every possible question you can get asked. There will be ten of these in the series so that you have ten quotations to answer every single essay that can possibly come up. I hope you find that super useful. Uh, pop me some comments below if you can think of a better way to do it. And uh, don't forget to subscribe over here. See you soon on my channel.